folks. Welcome to another episode of Film Study. This is Ken McCusick, and we're here to talk about the defense tonight versus the Packers in that final preseason game on Saturday afternoon. I'll be doing the show solo tonight, no guest, and uh, talking a little football for the next, uh, I don't know how long it'll be. Let's just see. Uh, day football game again. Uh, good for analysts. Not always the greatest time to watch football, but uh, I enjoy day football in the uh, uh, in the fall. For, for certain. It, uh, it makes things a lot easier on me. Uh, enjoy a night game occasionally, too, much more as a fan than I do as an analyst. But uh, uh, anyway, nice day game in Green Bay. Uh, all the tradition there of the bicycle riding to practice, to joint practice, which was uh, pretty cool to see. I'd never seen that before personally, but uh, uh, that was an interesting uh, thing that showed up on the internet in the last couple of days. The game itself, another matter. Obviously, a very disappointing finale for the Ravens in multiple ways. Um, most importantly, the Ravens suffered a number of injuries in the game uh, that throw some of the roster into question. And, you know, their, their roster decisions will have to be made by Tuesday at 4 p.m. They have a number that were dramatically complicated by losses suffered in that exhibition game, in that preseason game. Let's not use 1970s lingo if we can avoid that but it, it was a uh, game that uh, certainly in addition to the to the cost in terms of players and the injuries as a significant cap cost to the Ravens as well so players that they um, might have cut um, now are employed uh, on IR and um, unfortunately they may have a split contract they may have other reasons why they won't cost as much as a um, uh, a player who made the team, but uh, it's it's not a good situation to have players be injured for cap purposes. And it's, of course, it's terrible in terms of trying to manage your roster and, and make sure you can fill the 53. They lost some players who were definitely important. Um, and you can start with Owen Wright, who was in line to be the third string running back. Um, you know, a guy who's in his second year of camp, a second year player after being a full year on the practice squad. He and Ali were fighting for the job as any two rookies might. Ali, a fifth-round draft pick, it's true, uh, but had made a number of mistakes, put the ball on the ground uh, um, on a kickoff return, even though it was was after the whistle was – after the play was blown dead, uh, dropped a pass, didn't run effectively in his one game, and then he got hurt. Uh, Wright had been very effective in multiple phases of the game, didn't have a great game running the ball in his second game, but had caught passes, made a good move to get to the end zone, um, had played very well in camp. And honestly, he was well ahead of Ali in the camp depth chart uh, before uh, the preseason started. And then throughout the preseason, we've seen him as a number one running back, the first guy in the game. So anyway, Wright um, fractured foot. It is said to be not season ending. Of course, when I think of a fractured foot, I think of a French doctor, I believe his name, Liz Frank, comes to mind as, as a, um, a possibility of the type of injury. Hopefully that's not true. Uh, they've identified it. Harbaugh did as a hairline fracture of the foot. Hopefully that's a, um, a different bone involved and truly will be something that's not season ending. Um, it makes it a little difficult for the Ravens to find a spot for Owen Wright. And we'll talk about that more on the offense show tomorrow because we're getting the, the primary objective. We'll talk about what happened in these games, sorry, in this game for both the offense and defense and give you some detail on the play and, you know, who might have increased their stock a little bit. But we're also going to talk primarily about what the roster should be on Tuesday afternoon. And that'll be the, the what we lead up to in each of these shows. So we'll get to that in uh uh, in the second part of the show, and you'll you'll have a chance to listen to it here. The first part, we're going to talk about more about what happened during the game and and who played well, et cetera, et cetera. One thing the Ravens did not do well at all in this game was stop the run. And, uh, and just statistically, it worked out very poorly for the Ravens. They allowed the Packers 193 rushes for, sorry, 193 rushing yards on, on 39 attempts. So it's 4.9 yards per carry. And... The Packers, it was worse than that because the Packers ran very efficiently. They didn't have a single run longer than 18 yards, but they had a number of runs which were between 6 and 18 yards. In fact, they had 12 in the game that were 6-plus yards, um, and those just mauled the Ravens and uh, gave the Packers a very decisive advantage in um, plays for the game. Uh, the Ravens also helped them with some with some good turnover football that they played, particularly with Devin Leary in the game. 
but they out snapped the uh, the Packers out snapped the Ravens sixty five to fifty one in the game, uh, which was part of the problem. Now they had ten rushing first downs. That was a half of the total first downs they got in the game. Uh, it is very bad when you give up double digits first down rushing the football. You you will not commonly win that football game, and it's 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 not necessarily a causal effect as as you probably know that the team who is um, winning the game often will continue to try and run the football to. Uh, uh, stall out the game, finish out the game, close out the game, and they'll do so with some additional first downs um, that they get at that point. So uh, running first downs are pretty pretty darn well correlated towards winning football games. One of the questions that arises from this is, is this a problem for the Ravens entering the regular season? And I would tend to say no i think of the um or at least n- not no n- not yes for that reason if not no um they have a number of of their best run stoppers that obviously we're not playing michael pierce uh travis jones roquan smith all not playing they didn't have their outside linebackers away or van noy their top two guys um, and they were do- making do with, uh, you know, basically some situational pass rushers, uh, Tavius Robinson and Joe Evans at outside linebacker. So um, they, they didn't they didn't have a lot they um, uh, in terms of situational run defenders uh, at that position. Uh, in addition, uh, one of their good run defenders is Malik Harrison. And he didn't play outside linebacker. He played inside linebacker in this game. And um did not was not tremendously effective either at inside linebacker, uh, but uh, but the Ravens will have dif- different players out there, and just having Roquan Smith out there naturally means that the Ravens are going to be better at flowing to the football, at filling the correct gaps. Roquan has always provided very good keys for the other defenders in terms of moving to the right place. Um, we saw Patrick Queen's play improve significantly after Roquan arrived, uh, and. You know, other other players as well. The whole defense was a lot better as soon as Roquan arrived. And I think we'll see some of that in, in the early part of the season. Of course, Kyle Hamilton uh, will be on the field. That takes away a lot of the um, run-like elements of the passing game, particularly the strong side of the field. But it's also, he's a good run defender as well. And he's someone who uh, helps the Ravens there. And uh, they had players on the field who were uh, not, because nobody is the sort of tackler that that Kyle Hamilton is from the slot. So uh, in terms of, of whether or not I'm really concerned about this at this point, I'm, I'm really not. I do think it'll be a question once the season begins, how much Orr's scheme will mimic what McDonald did last year, which basically gave up success versus the run in a way the Ravens have never done before. So the Ravens have never previously in their history been a team that was satisfied giving up somewhat over four yards per carry and in exchange shutting down the passing game to an additional degree. And the payoff was completely worthwhile last year. It paid off with a triple crown defense in terms of points, in terms of turnovers, in terms of sacks. Um, You can't ask for more than that, obviously, but they had a huge improvement in passing yards per attempt that was offset by a modest um, decrease or, or worsening of their um, yards per attempt rushing uh, against. Uh, so anyway, uh, the Ravens are a team that if they play like the Lamar Jackson teams of recent years, will have the lead more often than not, uh, will be defending the lead and running the ball themselves more often than not, and will hopefully be in a position where um, other teams cannot afford to run the ball. Now, when they, when they allow that to happen, that's generally not a good thing. And uh, and that's when the Ravens can end up losing some ball games. Um, so that's uh, uh, certainly important uh, that the Ravens uh, figure that out. The Rams were the one team last year who really were able to run the ball down the Ravens' throat. They did so nine consecutive plays on that first drive, and then all of a sudden they got inside the twenty and they decided, oh, we don't need to run the ball anymore. Let's just throw it in, and they and they couldn't do it. So uh, they I think they settled for three at that point and end up losing the game in overtime. So um, I'm not at this point. I don't have an overwhelming concern that the Ravens can't stop the run or that they'll maintain this going into the season. It's been very tough preseason to watch and analyze. 
in terms of run failures. We're writing up play after play of who got blocked by whom at the point of attack that has created these opportunities. And, um, you know, it's it's a lot of really undermanned units and particularly the undermanned defensive lines um, that they've had game after game. Um, you know, they've, they've had some, some outside linebackers who aren't really used to playing edge in the NFL. Joe Evans, uh, in particular, in that first game against the Eagles, was not very good. Uh, got blocked by the tight end a few times. He's played better since, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But uh, it's just a uh, – I, I think it's more a matter of the shorthandedness of the Ravens that they've had difficulty versus the run. I think the the real Raven number ones that we'll, we'll see come September 5th um, are still plenty talented uh, uh, defensive uh, unit. All right. Now, one of the things I complained about last week was that the Ravens did not get after the play action boots, particularly in that first half. So remind everybody, boot play, usually zone blocking in one direction. There is a, um, a fake handoff, and the quarterback rolls out in the opposite direction. Uh more oftentimes than not naked in that situation. Um, if he's not naked, it means they're, they're making some attempt to block, block the backside edge player. And that backside edge player plays a critical role because he's the one who has to immediately run right at the quarterback and try to get him to make a quick decision to get rid of that football. The boot is set up to get an opportunity at one of three levels on the side the quarterback rolls to. And if he is given ample time and space because that defensive edge player, that that backside edge defender, is fooled on the play and somehow meanders into the backfield and looks around, as they did five out of six times last week against the Falcons in the first half, then um, that can create some big plays. And it did in, in that game. It was most of the Falcons' passing offense. It was most of the Falcons' offense in that first half. Um, and, uh, and that fortunately, or found a way to uh, to stuff it up in the second half. Well, in this game, uh, they got after the boot much more effectively. So mostly it was Tavius Robinson who was doing it, who was, who was recognizing the boot quickly. I suspect it was a point of emphasis in practice during the week. Maybe in the maybe in the rooms, maybe on the field. Not sure because I wasn't in Green Bay. Uh, I wasn't obviously. Nobody was at the practice on Friday um, in terms of their their walkthrough. But I think that they probably looked at what had happened on film and said, "We're not letting this happen again." And they got after the boot very well. And they, they had a lot of pressured boot plays uh, early in this game. Uh, a lot of it by Robinson, and uh, uh, it was one of his really big contributions to the defense in this game. All right. We still have not seen anything really special or unique in terms of packages or scheme from or, you know, a couple different blitzes, normal twists at the line of scrimmage, nothing, nothing really special. We we certainly haven't seen something like Martindale pulled out early in his tenure as the defensive coordinator, the race car with either four or even five outside linebackers on the field. We have, whatever or has got up his sleeves, he's he's holding it back for a Thursday a week when uh, we probably will see some some uh, packages that we didn't expect to see versus Kansas City. It's always really fun to do that first defensive article, process through the who's on the field, and 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 look at the defensive scheme that's being employed in that very first week of the season. And you see all this new stuff. It's really fun. Uh, it's one of the things I look forward to every year. And it's happened pretty much even when it's the same coordinator with different personnel, you'll often see some you know, slightly different twists on things. Uh, we'll see a coordinator who will be learning his way towards adjusting in the NFL. Uh, you know, we've seen the adjustment to the boot in the second half versus the Falcons was one thing. We'll, we'll see some more complex thing. I, first of all, I think that um, Mahomes and Reed will throw more different things and have adjustments of their own that they make in the second half, probably some planned adjustments that they know are coming in the second half if they are if they have the lead, for example, that Orr will then have to adjust to on the fly. So there won't be a time to uh, uh, you know go to a locker room and try to figure it out or have 12 minutes even to, to figure out. He'll have to figure it out on the fly. And that will be interesting to see. Um, so you hope that, that, that as has often happened in the Lamar Jackson era, that they can get ahead of opponents and not face as much of that. Cause obviously you have the lead, you can make a preemptive adjustment in terms of how you want to run your scheme differently in the second half. 
And it, that's a that's a, a more difficult thing probably to figure out than if you have a more limited playbook you're working from because you have to pass to catch up in the second half. So uh, this will be really interesting. It will be really interesting to see what Zach Orr brings to the table. Um, everybody uh, points to his brilliance as being something that is that is very special. He's well spoken at the podium. He's a he's a I would say he's a um, you know a sharp guy uh, certainly. Uh, let's see some of that in terms of actual football application. And I don't really think we've had a chance to see any of that in this preseason. Really looking forward to it during the regular season and uh, and see if he can uh, bring the same kind of in-game acumen that McDonald did, um, you know, starting from a system McDonald had. I, I, and I, I also think it's probably a little bit unfair to expect him to be McDonald, even though McDonald is quite young. Um, and I don't recall exactly how old he is, but he's 35, 36, 37 years old. He's in that range and he's getting his first head coaching job. Or is 32 and is the second youngest coordinator, I believe, on either side of the ball in the entire NFL. But he's certainly at least the second youngest defensive coordinator. And it's a big ask to ask him to be in that same, um, at that same level. Each of them served an internship in a different way. So, or actually went on a one year internship to Michigan, if you want to call it that, to be their defensive coordinator under, under Jim Harbaugh. And then came back to the Ravens, and uh, uh, you know, in Orr's case, he's been working under McDonald for his most of his years in the NFL. I guess he worked under um, uh, Martindale as well uh, for a time. So he's he's grown up certainly in this system that's been extremely successful, um, and, but he hasn't really gone off to lead a unit all by himself coming into this job. So there'll be probably some growing pains, and 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 we'll see how this uh, how this plays out uh, come September fifth. All right, well, let's move on a little bit and we'll talk a little bit about the deployment order. And deployment order always matters in the preseason, primarily for how the Ravens view their own roster depth. Okay, because the PR department makes a depth chart. It's crapola. I mean, in terms of, of what it is, it is straight crap. They go by a set of rules that they think. Harbaugh wants to do starting with rookies have to earn it as a as a as a general principle. So they'll generally put even high round rookies they'll put towards the bottom of the depth chart. So Hayden Hurst, I think, came in his first year and was the number four tight end after being a first round draft pick. Well, that better not be true. But but in any case, uh, you know, it um, that had to play itself out before they would put him ahead. I, I don't remember if they had James Hurst ahead of Orlando Brown at right tackle, but that would have been the same sort of thing. Uh, I believe they put Tyler Linderbaum as the number one at center right off the bat as a first round draft pick. I don't remember what they did with Hamilton uh, in, in terms of how he was uh, expected to jump into a role right away. But as a number 14 overall pick, they probably should have done something. Uh, in any case, uh, the, the depth chart, it can be a comical anti-rookie um, representation that's there. In truth, the Ravens have a more balanced view of that thing, but Harbaugh still has, if anything, been extremely slow to give away jobs to rookies um, starting the very first game. He's more favored rotational play. This year, for example, we've seen a great uh, preseason from Nate Wiggins. Uh, it, does he deserve a starting role? On just about any team in the NFL, he'd probably have one. In on this team, with Marlon Humphrey and Stevens, and Marlon Humphrey has been the demon of camp. He has been the best Ravens player on either side of the ball. So, uh, you know, it's he's not I, – I, he won't take Marlon's job away, but he could probably play rotationally with Marlon. He could embolden them to use Marlon in the slot or perhaps in some sort of hybrid safety role um, were that to occur. But, uh, uh, you know, it's a, it, they've got – multiple choices and it's it'd be an interesting thing i I actually kind of love the idea of having hamilton be a slot corner slash strong safety and humphrey also be a slot corner slash strong safety where i think you would get a lot of great back end play from humphrey who i think is shown ability to find the football in this camp that tells me he's ready to play safety right now he says those conversations have not occurred with the coaches yet. I asked him the question specifically when he's at the podium, but he did say he thought he would end his career or, or, or move to safety at some point during his career. I think he's probably correct. And I think that's the way, you know, a player like him extends a potential hall of fame career 
by playing, say, four years at safety to to finish it out. So he'll be a, um, you know, he has a year or two at least left at cornerback, hopefully. And and then at some point he'll he'll move to safety, hopefully rack up a ton of picks. Um, think Rod Woodson in terms of a guy who was very effective uh, moving there late in his career and and did very well um, in terms of, of turnovers at that point. Um, but he, he's he's a guy who certainly has the skill set to play that position, has the physicality to play that position, is good tackler. Um, you know, it's just, he obviously, if you, if you look at all of the prerequisites, he checks all the boxes for a guy who can move to safety. It's just, is he too valuable to do so? If, is he too valuable to give up an outside corner right now? And the answer is probably yes. So uh, at some point that may come, the Ravens are going to have to prove they have other talent uh, to make that happen, or it's the move will have to happen out of necessity because he loses a step and is no longer really the ideal guy to play on the outside has to rely more on his instincts. The further back you play off the line of scrimmage, the more your instincts uh, come into play, and the more he's likely to be uh, uh, to be a guy that that can handle that role. Anyway, let's talk about the deployment order by position. We'll start at corner, where the big guys obviously all sat out, and the big guys now include Ardarius Washington, who sat out of this game after what were reported to be excellent practice, an excellent practice against the Packers on Thursday. Uh, he sat out, was given starters treatment, along with Humphrey and Stevens, who haven't played in any of the preseason either. Um, and they they started with uh, at right corner JAD, who is uh, he's secured his roster spot at this point. I still have some. Um, Reservations about his ability to find the ball in the air that I've been very public about, but he's he's no doubt about it, a roster lock at this point. They started with Holman at left corner, and um, they had Williams, Pepe Williams, in the slot. Now, we'll get into Pepe Williams a little bit later. Had a kind of a tough game, and, and we'll have to go through you know what the implications of that are, whether it's a, whether it's a big deal or not. Um, but uh, JAD played well enough that that his spot is not in any jeopardy. In any jeopardy, and Holman was the starter at left corner, which is is a um, a feather in his cap, I would say, in terms of where he is right now. In fact, I think uh, there's a more legitimate um, competition between him and Bump Cooper that could have made Cooper the number one corner. In this game, they could have given an extended trial to Cooper. The Packers have a fairly deep set of wide receivers that could have challenged Cooper. Um, and uh, and that could have been something if they were really looking to do it, that would have made a lot of sense. So it looks like Cooper is still behind Holman on the depth chart. But there is a big difference because Holman is a I believe he's a fourth year player. I looked this up the other day. But the point of this is the Ravens do not have claim on any of Holman's future. Uh, let me confirm this. Yeah, he's a fourth-year player. So if the Ravens cut him, he actually has to go through waivers. That's that's one thing important. So he's not a potential member of the handshake crew, as I understand the rules. Uh, of course, I will say for P.J. Mustafer last year, they cut him, and he did not have to go through waivers, and his number was four in the years of service on the Ravens roster. So I don't know what the why that would be, but in any case – um, I, I believe that Holman would have to go through waivers if he's cut. So there is there would be some risk in not being able to retain him. There obviously is always still some risk. Then another team just says, hey, we got a better opportunity on our practice squad. Or, you know, we can give you an opportunity in week two, but we can't give you an opportunity right now, which is a thing a lot of teams do when they don't want to guarantee the salary for the year effectively. They just want you to pay you week to week. So they want to they want to uh, do that, and the Ravens have players, at least one player that they might want to do that for this year. So um, it's 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 something that another team might do, and then they still can sell them on the notion that they've got a better opportunity at cornerback, which a lot of teams do because the Ravens, frankly, have a very deep cornerback group. So you compare that to Cooper. Cooper is a um, rookie, and he is a player who the Ravens have a four year claim on his services. So it's true he's undrafted. So the fourth year will come as an RFA. It'd be at a slightly higher salary, but that's not important. The important, it's not really important. The important thing is if you've got the potential to have a star cornerback here and you got four years of him, that's a hell of a lot better than a one year claim on a veteran who is walking at the end of the year. So you're, you're 
for a lot of reasons, even though Cooper came in behind Holman, I'm not entirely convinced that that means Holman makes the team over Cooper on a what is a relatively complex and nuanced depth chart. Let's move to right cornerback where J.D. was first. Mullen was second. Uh, Now, Mullen suffered another injury in this game, and it's his second uh, shoulder dislocation of this summer. Okay, now that is probably going to end his Ravens career. At least that would be my my thought about the matter. He he might end up on on IR for the year. I don't really see it. Um, I think probably cut with an injury settlement is where things end up with Mullen, if I understand the rules correctly. Um, and it, he recovered fairly quickly from his last shoulder separation. So maybe there's another team out there that would be more interested. And I frankly think he'd be right on the cusp of making the team if he was healthy. So he'd be competing with, say, TJ Tampa for the fifth outside corner spot. Um, but, the, but he's definitely in a tight competition there. And then uh, Christian Matthew, who uh, has some pro experience already, I think with Arizona, but he may have been with other NFC South teams. But Christian Matthew is a third-year player currently. So you also look at that as a gradation that the Ravens only have this year and next year for a player like Matthew. And in fact, I believe next year would be a RFA year for him as well. I could be wrong about that. He might have he might have signed a contract that incorporates his his uh, uh, original uh, drafted deal. All right. And then at slot corner, the, f- the first up was Pepe Williams. He basically played the entire game um, at slot corner. Now, not quite. He, he played f- over the course of the entire game would be the w- better way to say it. And he... Uh, let me get my appropriate sheet out here. Yeah, he um, uh, was in there at the end of the game. Now, one thing I can tell you is that's not a good thing. If you're in a preseason game and you're in the game at the very end, um, that's a that's a big red flag. You're not going to be on the team um, for a third or fourth year player. Um, we've had had it happen with Willie Henry a few years ago. He was still in the in the game. Um, late in the fourth quarter, uh, it's good for getting tape. It's a, it's actually a benefit to that player probably for letting him get some tape uh, that, that other teams can look at. Um, Pepe Williams, there's some tape from the regular season, but most of his good tape is from the preseason. So uh, he he may or may not really appreciate the Ravens doing this little favor, but I think that the likelihood, and we'll get into this in the roster thing, is that Pepe Williams is going to be cut. So. Uh, the injuries may, particularly to Mullen, may provide an opportunity for him to hang on at the fringe of the roster. Um, but I, I don't think he's a, um, I don't think he's a high probability pick at this point. Same thing applies for Pepe, who is a third year player, uh, and for JAD, who is a third year player. Um, they have less sand, sand left in the hourglass than, a, than a, a rookie corner does. So a player like Cooper, who's the major competition pretty much for everybody in the secondary, who's on the on the cusp, um, you know, has a has a lot of potential value. Move on to safety. Uh, the top four safeties did not play for the Ravens. There's no Eddie Jackson. There's no Ardarius Washington, who also could be considered slot corner. Um, and there was no Hamilton, and there was of course no Marcus Williams. So they all sat. That did not leave a lot for the Ravens to go through, but they got through the entire game with Braid, Worley, and Kane playing all the snaps. Now, the, the the fact that there are seven guys that the Ravens can have at safety is, is a little daunting. Now, I will say this is a team that basically can relieve pressure that might accrue from at least two other position groups out of their safety talent pool. Now, what do I mean by that? The inside linebackers, if they lost somebody, like let's say they lost Roquan, I think the Ravens would have to move to a dime package they would have a two down thumper it might be harrison they 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 have simpson move over to play the mic on third down and they bring in a dime back to um uh play on third down as well so that would be a safety uh i guess it could be hamilton of the pro- that would be taking out of the kind of his normal habitat and probably 
probably making less of him would would be my feeling. But they've got other options. They've got Ardarius Washington. They'd have Braid would be a possibility. Braid's been a terrific downhill player this camp, so, so I think that could work. So anyway, they, they've got options that they could fix an injury problem that occurs at inside linebacker with their safety pool. So it doesn't. So it might behoove them to take an extra uh, to keep an extra safety than than teams normally would. The other thing they have they have a safety who plays um slot corner half or more of the snaps in Hamilton and we hope that continues this year because um the half of the snaps um when when he when he was not playing it was because the Ravens couldn't play him there or the other team was in obvious passing situation. Well it's good to put the other team in passing situations it's not good to have a situation where you don't have enough healthy bodies to allow Hamilton to play that big nickel role where he was so successful. And I think he's much more effective close to the line of scrimmage where he can take away that strong side of the football field. As I always say, and I'm sure you've heard me say it before, he's the best horizontal defender in the entire NFL. So I think that he, he bring he is such an asset there and he does so much for the defense um, teams like Cincinnati all of a sudden have no options against the Ravens. And the, and the reason is if you have a good back end pair um, playing cover two and you're Joe Burrow and you have kind of a weak arm. All right. You've got accuracy, but you've got kind of a weak arm. Uh, you have to do an awful lot to push the ball down the field uh, without complete fear. And Geno Stone had an interception on an 0 for 7 day of 15 plus yards that Burrow had in that first game in Baltimore last year. Most of their offense is pushed to the outside on wide receiver screens. Well, guess what? That's right into the teeth of Kyle Hamilton, who takes away that strong side of the field. Unless you're going to, unless you're just going to throw swing passes to the other side of the field where you've got a single receiver, um, generally speaking, you can't stay away from Hamilton on wide receiver screen passes. You could throw short to a, to a wide receiver takes a step back or, or whatnot, but then you've got a cornerback running downhill at him and you've got other options to try and get that tackle made. Hamilton is, is so disruptive on the strong side of the field that you can't get your blocking scheme set up. He's too quick to the ball. He's, he's too long to be blocked easily by most receivers. If you get a tight end on him, he's, he might have the, the proper length to handle him, but Hamilton might be too quick. So just all of the the things that Hamilton brings to defending the strong side of the football field are a huge part of what makes the Ravens the the, the defense they were in 2023. All right, so Braid, Worley, and Kane all sitting on the outside. So Worley is a special case because he's a potential handshake deal. He's almost certainly cut uh, so the Ravens can take advantage of additional spots on injured reserve occurring after roster cut down days. So this is important. If you put somebody on IR prior to cut down, there are two spots you're allowed to designate for return. But if you have five guys say that you want to return during the season that have various levels of injury, you got to you got to put them on the roster, put other players through waivers or expose them to potential signing for other clubs if they're veterans. Um into the general street pool of talent, then the day after roster cutdowns, you can move those players to IR where it's not season ending. But if they go to IR before roster cutdown, then they that's on that's season ending IR unless they take one of these two special spots, which are designated for exactly exactly that purpose a non non season ending IR. All right, so Worley gives the Ravens and Brent Urban is another player, gives the Ravens an additional slot to fit in a player on a, to, on a non-season-ending arc because both those guys could be handshake. They can be told, hey, we're going to re-sign you in a week. Um, you know, Be patient with us. We've always been good to you. Then they can put two other players on the roster. They can um, move those guys to IR on Wednesday, I guess it is. Um, uh, after after a Tuesday roster cutdown, and I'm not sure if there's if they have to wait some certain number of days, but there, but there'd be a you know a, a point at which they're allowed to move those guys, and then they they bring back Urban, they bring back Worley. In the case of Urban, they're going to bring him back for Week One. There's no doubt in my mind because they they need him as one of their five defensive linemen. I suppose it's possible they could do it by a practice squad elevation. I think it's much more likely they do that with a player like Worley, who's a Probably important to the team as a fifth safety, 
um, who has a lot of versatility, who allows them a lot of versatility, let's put it that way, could move to the dime himself, um, uh, can play on the back end and split field. We saw him do that well last year. So um, there, there are options, um, uh, but uh, with Worley, they have an advantage in terms of if they wait till week two, that they don't have to pay. Uh, they don't guarantee his salary for the whole year. So they're effectively paying him week to week. Um, in case of Brain or Cade, Braid or Kane, the advantage of signing those guys, of course, is four years of team control. So if they want one of them, if one of them is good enough, then they'll probably make the roster. If not, they'll probably make the practice squad. I don't believe either of them is an enormous risk to be taken away immediately by a waiver claim. So my guess is both would pass through, make the practice squad or be offered the practice squad, and then maybe be offered to the practice squad by other teams as well. So you'd have to you'd have to fear that that might be the case. But um, but I think I think they'd both be offered practice squad slots. Um, Braid's case, uh, we'll talk about him a little bit in the second show. But but you know some of the things he's shown, it hasn't been clear that he's been a good um, split field safety. What is clear is he's a great downhill tackler. He's probably a good special teams player, and uh, has a really great ability to get to the football in a hurry and not have to use form tackling always to get the guy down. He, absolutely great undercutter as we've seen in this. And so um, there, there's some value to a player like that. He'd probably be an excellent dime back would be my guess. Um, for some teams who need run fits more than they need coverage on the back end, or they have a, have a single high safety they like, and they play a lot of single high, then Braid is a player who makes sense as the strong safety. But I don't think for the Ravens who, you know, probably are still going to want to show a lot of split field looks that he makes nearly as much sense. And his great plays have all been close to the line of scrimmage this year. His not so great plays have been off the line of scrimmage. And that should be a pretty big flag for what the Ravens, how the Ravens want to craft his role. Let's put it that way. They want a special teams guy. If it doesn't matter them too much, if him being the fifth safety say, then he could be, he could be the guy. And I think the same could go for Kane. I haven't seen anything from Kane in terms of play on the back end that I'd I'd say, yeah, I, I, I got to have more of that. So right now, that's how I feel about both of them. They're actually pretty similar. Their box safety is a kind of term that is is not exactly what I like. But they're they're players who are more effective closer to the line of scrimmage. They're probably more dime backs than split field safeties for sure. And in terms of all the responsibilities of a strong safety that the Ravens might want, I don't think they're they're the best fit uh, for that. Although, you know, both of them, either of them could be good football players. Move on a little bit. Inside linebacker, we saw Simpson play way too much in this football game. Uh, 54 snaps in total. He returned on two separate occasions after he'd left the football game. Um with injuries first to Rigby and then to Jennings. Okay, so Rigby went out, I think, early in the fourth quarter, and Jennings went out a little later in the fourth quarter after Rigby had returned and relieved Simpson again, and then Jennings was gone for good. I I never heard the nature of the injuries in either case, um, but the fact that Rigby returned is is good, um, certainly. Here's what's really surprising about this. At the, they had played Harrison early in the game a fair amount. He hadn't played all that well, but he also hadn't played that many snaps. And he's Harrison. He's not Simpson. Now, Harrison's very important to the Ravens. Don't, don't get me wrong. He can play outside linebacker. He could be an important replacement at um, inside linebacker, and he's the special teams captain. So in a lot of ways, that versatility has a value that you might equate or, or, or uh, make analogous, analogous to Patrick McCary on the offensive line as a guy who can play a lot of positions and you really need to make sure you maintain his health because he can, he can be a trump card to help you out in a number of different ways. Well, with Harrison, I, it's not that I don't believe that with that. It's just, I believe Simpson is tremendously important as a defensive playmaker on, on the weak side there to maintain his health. And he might also be a slightly more fragile player than Harrison. I don't have any, any great cause of size, to ascribe that, but Malik Harrison has has basically been a healthy player, and it'd be nice to 
um, make sure he's he's around for all those things. But on that, on the, I'm I'm more concerned that Simpson, with a, a play style that's fairly aggressive, would be injured in the latter moments of a game like this. By the way, if if you watch this game on Saturday. The thing that really stood out about watching Harbaugh on the sidelines, they must have gone to him 15 times in that second half, is he could not wait. He could not wait for that game to be over. Okay, Injuries started to happen in the first half. Maybe he wanted to look at some players early, but basically he wanted to get that game over with. And they ran the ball, I think, seven of the last eight, eight of the last nine plays, you know, when they were well down. They ran Collier directly up the middle five straight times on that final drive to end the game. Collier amazingly got him a first down. But, they, they, you know, they ran out the clock on themselves, which is appropriate in a 37 game. I'm not saying it isn't. But Harbaugh just incredibly frustrated, written all over his face all during the game. The, 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 the number of mistakes, the penalties, the poor coverage – uh, a lot of the things that went wrong on defense, the incredible things that went wrong on offense in this game. Oh, there are so many in terms of the, the turnovers, the missed assignments, the, all, all of the things. Talk more about the, that on the offensive side of the show. But Harbaugh was pissed off about that game, and he wanted it to be over. I don't think it'll be a fun film session for the Ravens players with Harbaugh. I guess they may have had it today or they may have had the day off after the game, and they'll have it on Tuesday. But Whenever they have to look at film, it's it's not going to be fun if they have to look at it with Harbaugh there. If they look at it in their position groups, um, it'll still probably be pretty bad, but it it, uh, it won't be as bad as if Harbaugh is um, spitting flames over over what happened in this game. So, uh, yeah, I think probably in this case, everybody gets a little break because Tuesday's cut day, and that'll be the primary focus of the team um, then. So I think the film from this game – while it'll be awful, we'll take a back seat to a lot of the uh, turkizing that'll go on on uh, on Tuesday. All right. So anyway, the the point I was making is the interesting point was that Harrison did not go back in the game. Stimson went back in the game and ended up playing fifty four snaps. Move on. Outside linebacker, they got by with only three players there the whole game. Ajabo, uh, who played only during the first half, uh, Robinson who played all the entire game and Evans who played the entire game. Uh, those three guys took a hundred between them split up a hundred percent of the outside linebacker snaps. They had two outside linebackers every play. Uh, they didn't play anything by the way, except uh, a few snaps of base and nickel the rest of the time. They didn't, again, like I'm saying in terms of packages, they didn't have anything. They didn't throw out any dime. They didn't you know, mix into some big nickel or you know do anything. Oh, that'd be crazy. That'd be putting like spice in our gruel. Uh, at this point, they went with the all gruel diet that has become typical of NFL franchises during the preseason. And there are really there are kind of two benefits. The first is you don't give anything away, and that's probably the seventy point condition with John Harbaugh. Uh, you know, being being the head coach is like just don't give anything away. Um, and then the thirty point value is you see players playing in a base package, and that may not have the advantage in the same they, way they would. In a uh, in a package that's more tailored to that game situation, and Harbaugh's alluded to this at the podium. Some he said he's not as worried about um, defending in a particular scheme. Um, I thought the example that he used because I was asking about the boot plays at the time um, was not really very good because that's it's really an individual play that has to be made by that backside edge defender to go after the quarterback. So that's really more of a, Hey, he's, he's not in the most advantage, but it's a recognition job. It's a one man job within the context of this team sport, which you don't get too often. And he's, uh, uh, you know, just got to do that. But, but anyway, Harbaugh makes a valid point that, you know, we're less concerned about scheme then um, we, the Ravens are less concerned about scheme than they are about um, uh, making sure that, that that players are tested in these uh, individual circumstances. All right. So we already had a ton of plays from Evans in previous weeks, but Evans played uh, another bunch of plays this week. But Robinson actually led the defense in snaps. I think he had 57 in the game. And if I recall, they had like 100 and uh, sorry, 65 defensive snaps for the um I, I think that's actual plays not including penalties for the um uh Packers in this one. So uh, Robinson played the bulk of the snaps to be sure and Ajabo played a few. 
move on to the defensive line. Now, you know, obviously the Ravens, the only two defensive linemen they put out there who will see time during the regular season were Washington and Urban. Uh, Washington only played early, uh, and, and he was taken off the field after, I believe, his three series, but anyways, in the first half. And darn, I lost my little sheet here that has the all the important information on you should make yourself one of these, by the way, on um yeah, the order of entry. Here it is. So um if you want to make a simple sheet that will tell you a lot about how the, the Ravens view their depth chart, just write the positions across the top. And so for, for, for the defense, it's pretty simple. You have your, your defensive linemen, outside linebackers, inside linebackers, cornerbacks, and safeties. Then have two lines per drive. The first line is who started that drive at each position, and the second line contains any replacements at those positions. And just with that, you'll be able to tell an amazing amount about what those coaches think about each individual player. And I use it consistently on these podcasts and to write my articles uh, on these games uh, each year. And when I'm writing the individual uh, you know, player notes, I talk about when they entered the game and, and how many snaps they played and who were they behind and who were they ahead of and yada, yada is all, is all important stuff. So you can do that for yourself. It's not a hard thing to do. And, and uh, uh, again, just, just uh, have a single sheet of paper, one for the, one for the offense. You can use the backside for the defense and save graph paper. Um, or regular paper, if that's how you prefer to do it, um, and and write in these numbers. All right. So outside linebacker, we talked about defensive line. We were we were, we were talking about. It. So Washington left the game fairly early, so he played for the first four series. So midway through Q two, he retired for the game, and uh, he didn't he didn't play all of those snaps either. Brent Urban was on the field with him. Now, the problem with Urban, and not a problem, but what they asked Urban to do is uh, Deidrin Sanat was hurt late in the game, and Urban had to return in the second half to replace his snaps. So the defensive line otherwise would have been overtaxed or, or frankly, um, been down to only two players remaining um, uh, at that point. So it meant you could only play nickel and not base. Um, towards the end of the game. And of course, the the, um, the Packers were happy to try and run the ball and get the game over with. So the Ravens probably wanted a base defense in there and uh, and they had to use Urban to do so. So, uh, you know, a, an extra thing you just wish you didn't have to do in a preseason game is is have anybody return to the field uh, due to injuries. In particular, you know, on the defensive line, you've got, you've got five guys that you're trying like hell to protect. They played every snap last year. They have an amazing record of durability last year. Uh, and then you look back to some of those players, and they don't have amazing records of durability in their career. Urban is in that group. Uh, Michael Pierce is certainly in that group. He's missed a lot of games in the last four or five years, uh, other than last year when he didn't miss any. And uh, and Jones so far has not had a big problem with injuries. But, uh, uh, you know, you've, you have players you're, you're trying to protect because that, that quality of the interior pass rush in particular – um, is just outstanding. It's one of the one of the real strengths of the Ravens. So they want to make sure uh, they don't take any chances with it. And Urban returning to a meaningless preseason game late is not a good thing. Uh, they they also the other guys in order. Sanat was next. Um, Wolfauer and then Ravenel. Um, not any big difference between those last three names in terms of who was out there first. But one of the unfortunate things is that uh, Tupo who'd played fairly well uh, as a kind of a nose tackle by trade, uh, who played pretty well so far in the preseason, uh, was injured and not able to go. So that that cut into their depth in a way that made it a little uncomfortable for the Ravens. If they had four to make three the whole game with uh, Tupo, Sanat, Walt Wolfauer, and Ravenel, that probably would have been fine. Uh, not ideal, but it would have been it would have been okay. They still had only seven guys to play those front five positions, um, which is that's very tight for a team that likes to play rotational football. So uh, anyway, they are they they had what they had, and uh, and they had to return Urban to the game. Uh, fortunately, I didn't hear any injury news from Urban. So uh, uh, the Ravens' defensive line goes into the season healthy, as far as I'm aware. So uh, that's very good news. All right, I'll tell you what, we're going to cut it here, and I'm going to be back in part two of the show with much more information. We're going to do two things primarily. We're going to talk about um, each position group, go through some individual players and how they played in this game. I'm going to talk about the defensive MVPs, which has 
not any meaning in a normal regular season game when you have a loss, but when you have a when you have a, a preseason game where development is the primary objective, I think there were some defensive MVPs that are worth mentioning. And then talk about the 25-man roster and how I think this is going to shake out. I'll give you my exact prediction on, on how I expect it to go, and there are a lot of complex moving parts to this, particularly with relation to injury, um, that make it more difficult to handicap. But I'll do my best job for you, and if you're in some sort of pool at work where you have to get your entry in by Tuesday afternoon, you, uh, you should have an opportunity to uh, uh, to plagiarize my work. Anyway, I, I uh, uh, will be back and talk to you about that. I will ask you, thank you for listening. I will just say, thank you for listening, folks. I have greatly appreciated my time at camp this summer and this preseason in particular, probably like none other. Um, it's, it's just been fantastic to be out there every single day and, uh, you know, a, a much closer feeling on the pulse of the team and what's going on. It's been a great deal of fun and I've really appreciated all the positive comments on the camp notes. I'd also like some other comments from you. So send me a DM. You don't have to, you don't have to splash it out there on Twitter and tell everybody, but send me a DM if you have some complaint about the camp notes in particular or about, um, the show and other things you'd like to hear about it. I'm, I'm very open to it. And that's also an opportunity a lot of times uh, to get your foot in the door if you'd like to come on the show and talk about football with me. Uh, we're doing this show without a without a guest, and I'm, I'm somewhat comfortable at doing this, but I'm always more comfortable talking football with a guest, and I have more fun doing it. So I, I appreciate having other people that I'm meeting through this. And uh, you know, I, since I chose to retire nine years ago, this has been uh, a, a, just a wonderful experience meeting all these new people around the Baltimore area. And, and you know, as far as Okinawa, um, who love to talk Ravens football. So uh, uh, please DM me. They're always open. I'd love to hear from you. I'd love to get you on a show. And thanks for listening. We'll be back in part two.